morning everyone welcome to the session entitled working workers sorting citizens surveillance government and the workplace my name is Meenal Srivastav. I'm an associate professor of uh, political economy and global studies at Athabasca University and I'm also on the board of uh, the Parkland Institute so it's my pleasure today to introduce um, JC Foster, who's going to be our first speaker, uh, also a colleague at Athabasca University. He's an academic coordinator for industrial relations um, and is a PhD candidate at St. Mary's University. His research interests include migrant workers, union re renewal, labor history, and diversity and equity in unions. He's also a close observer of workplace-related privacy issues. His most recent research focuses on the growth of migrant labor in Canada, its labor market effects and union responses. Uh, and what the bio doesn't mention is that he's also contributing to a new book on oil and democracy. Um, on a more serious note, Jason is also a beer writer, educator, and certified beer judge. So, <laughs> so I hand it over to Jason um, to make his presentation. I might need to get at the mouse, though. Yeah. Yep. So. Morning, everyone. It's probably good that they put me on in the morning, because when, whenever I speak in the afternoon, people expect me to bring beer. So, um, so but what I want to chat about today is, is the issue of workplace privacy. It's, I argue, and I believe, that it's actually one of the most misunderstood, under-understood areas of privacy law um, and, and, and issues around pri privacy political discussion in, in the country. It's confusing, people don't really know what their rights are, and we, very even re we rarely even talk about um, the impacts of surveillance and, and invasions of privacy in the workplace. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that which I'm going to walk through. So basically what I'm going to try and just do today is give you a little bit of the lay of the land um, of what the law says about workplace privacy, and then we're going to talk about what's really going on in terms of workplace privacy in Canada. Um, and essentially, oops, there we go. The question, there is a question legitimately in the beginning of the 21st century whether we still even have any privacy rights in the workplace. As, as this Dilbert cartoon likes to tell us, that employers know that they might be invading our privacy, but they're just kind of working on the assumption that we'll get used to it, right? So I want to start, though, with a couple of stories to sort of maybe give you a sense that it wasn't always this way. I'd like to tell you a story about my dad. My dad, for, for his entire working life, worked for moving companies. He was a mover. That's what he did for a living. And thankfully, um, he spent 26 years working for one of the very few unionized uh, moving companies in, in, in the country. And so as a result, we were able to actually have you know, a decent working class life. However, this is what his day would be like. He'd have to show up at work for 7.30. You know, he'd get his assignment or assignments for the day. He'd start, you know, he'd get assigned a truck, he and his partner. And they'd load up their truck with the dollies and the pads and whatever else they might need. And they were expected by 8 o'clock to be on the road. So they'd be at 8 o'clock. He and, and the other guys with their trucks, they'd all pull out of the, the company's parking lot at 8 o'clock on a dot, as they should. And they're supposed to then head off to the customer. But every day, without fail, all of them would drive a few blocks to a local coffee shop where they, had to, where they would then spend a half an hour having $1.99 bacon and eggs and visiting and chatting. And then they'd go off to the customer. Customer wasn't any wiser. They didn't know what time they were supposed to, re to arrive. Employer didn't really know or care because they did their jobs. They came home. It was all fine. Today, that would not be possible. It would not be possible to have that little bit of sort of opportunity to connect with your coworkers. Man, stick it to the boss a little bit too. They were doing a little bit of that. And it wouldn't be possible because of the nature of technology of what's happening today. And so I want to ask you, a question before I get into the topic. When was the last time you phoned a utility company, um, the government even, uh, any kind of company where you get that recording at the beginning of the phone call that says your call might be recorded for quality assurance purposes, right? Right? We all get it. Do you ever stop to think about what that means? Yeah, some of you do, good. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in the talk because it seems really innocent and it's become ubiquitous. And there's a question of whether it's even sort of legal, but we'll talk about that. So what I wanted to sort of connect about first is essentially the result of the, the, the threats to privacy in the workplace are very much a result of just advancing technology. Um, 
there has opened up a whole new range of opportunities and tools and techniques for employers to be able to create oversight in their workplace. The problem, though, is that the actual nature of the employment relationship has not changed. Not a whit, right? And the core of, there's two things at the core of the employment relationship that are important here. One is that there is, as most, of, most, most people who attend a Parkland conference will know, there's a power imbalance at work. Employers possess more power than workers do. And so that's, for example, why workers try and turn to unions to try and help sort of even the scale out a little bit for them. But the other piece of it is that an employer, when they hire someone, they don't actually, they don't own you. All they really are doing is renting your time, right? You agree to show up at a particular time, and they get to sort of t tell you what to do. But what the essence of management and the essence of the day-to-day -day relationship at a workplace is employers trying to extract as much work effort out of their workers as possible for productivity and profit reasons, and workers attempting to try and resist against that for reasons of dignity, for reasons of sort of quality of their working conditions, and just also because their, their interests are different than the employer's interests. And so nothing about that has changed. And so why this matters is that these technologies are being implemented in workplaces without any real debate or discussion about how they get used and what it might mean in terms of that power balance in the workplace. Um, and so as a result, we have a very underdeveloped sense of how these things affect our rights at work. What I find really fascinating is we spend a lot of time in society talking about privacy, and we get worried about the impacts of technology in our privacy, right? Facebook, right? And what happens when you, put, you get things posted on Facebook. Where there's a huge, I've read so many articles about Google Glasses, right? And what are the privacy implications of being able to record, have a little recording device on a, a pair of glass, eyeglasses that you could, I could be surreptitiously recording all of you. And we get all very worked up about this, and we have lots and lots and lots of debates about this. But we never talk about it when we cross over into the threshold of the workplace. Suddenly those discussions stop. And, I, and there's a reason for that. Um, but let me, before I talk about the reason, let me just give you a very quick, quick, quick rundown about what some of the tools are, just to, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so first of all, there's electronic surveillance, so video and audio recordings, that telephone core being, being recorded for, for quality of purposes. Access controls, so in other words, they, you know, we have these security systems now, right? We have to swipe to be able to kind of get through the security door, right? It all seems very innocuous, and obviously there's some positive reasons for it, but it's actually also another opportunity for the employer to be able to monitor your comings and goings, right? There's digital recording. There's amazing software packages now where they can record every single key stroke that you make on a keyboard. Right? They, of course, they, they, your email systems, your emails are very, tra they're, you're on your employer's server, so they can read your emails anytime they wish, and they can also obviously track your web usage. Right? So they, especially when you're on a computer, they can monitor virtually every action that you take throughout the course of the day. And then there's issues of, of what we call biometrics. So they, you know, lots of these security systems now, or, you know, there's voice recognition systems. You might have to touch your hand, you know, the higher tech ones, like you touch your hand to the pad, and that's your security entrance, right? Well, that's suddenly they're collecting per very direct personal information about you, right? And you, then it becomes moved beyond your control about what they do with that information. And then there's things like global positioning systems and radio frequency ID systems, which again allows them to track with remarkable precision where and when you are at any given point of the day. And that's why, for example, because of GPSs, my, my dad would never be able to go and get a $1.99 bacon and eggs anymore, right? And then, of course, there's health information, like drug testing. And drug testing is an area that I, I spend a fair bit of time trying to pay attention to, as well as psychological testing. Um, a lot of employers are engaging in that. That, again, is the collection of very real personal data, very real personal information about you that the employer is collecting and then makes decisions about how to use. So one of the reasons why um, we don't have a debate about the privacy rights is because most Canadians are so inundated by the American culture and American news that we actually don't have a sense that we even have any employment rights in terms of privacy in Canada. And it's because we don't realize that we actually have, we have in, in sort of the in, in legal realm, we've actually taken a different perspective than the U.S. has. So the U.S. has generally taken what we call a property approach. That basically, it's the employer's property, therefore... Employee, employees have no privacy rights whatsoever. And so that is the status in the United States. As an employee in the United States, you have virtually no right to privacy once you have crossed the threshold into your employer's workplace. Unless the employer deems to say, okay, well, we'll let you, we'll let you maintain some element of privacy. 
Europe, on the other hand, uses a rights approach where there's just this fundamental recognition that all employees as citizens are entitled to some minimal standard of dignity, privacy, and a private life even while working. And so their privacy law has evolved very differently than it has in North America. In Canada, what we like to, we call, we like to say we call, we create the balance approach because we're so Canadian, right? So we like to sort of say, well, privacy at work is not an absolute right. It needs to be balanced off against the employer's, and this is a quote, employer's legitimate need to maintain a safe, efficient, and productive workplace. I, I actually think that's a misnomer. I think it's better described as the uncertainty approach because it's created this huge mess of confusion. Um, and there's also a real fundamental flaw in this, in, in the way that we sort of think about this logic. And that's that it's trying to place workers' right to privacy, which is something that's anchored in notions of human rights and personal dignity. And we're trying to put it on the same footing as productivity and efficiency, which is a direct product of the economic system, which is a creation of, of peoples and of governments and of states in terms of, it's, so there's no actual sort of fundamental right to productivity, while there is a fundamental right to sort of levels of personal dignity. And of course, it also assumes, in a classic Canadian way, that employers and workers will eventually figure out some common ground around this. We'll, we'll figure it out in the middle somewhere, right? We'll find some way and we'll all be a big, happy family where you can record this much information about me, but you won't go any further, and we'll all be happy. And again, that's a fallacy, right? That's a false logic behind that. So let me give you a, quickly, a quick rundown of the state of the law because I could talk for about an hour and a half about the different details because it's a mess, quite frankly. So we have five principles. The key one is consent. Consent must be given, even in the workplace. Um, the second is that any collection of data in the workplace must be related to the employment relationship. The employer must be able to demonstrate that it is connected to your work as a worker, and as an employee of theirs. Third, it must be deemed as reasonable, and I want to come back to that one. Um, fourth, that your inf any information they collect must be treated confidentiality, confidential. Uh, and then finally, they have to give reasonable notice that they're going to collect the information. Um, the issue of reasonableness is actually quite difficult. The courts have come up with a four-part test, which I won't bore you with. Um, what I will just say, though, is it's, it's, it, what it's meant is it meant that it's any decision around what is an appropriate invasion of privacy at the workplace is highly context dependent. It's dependent upon the specifics of that, spe of that case and that case alone. And so it becomes impossible to be able to make generalized notions of what is allowed and what is not allowed. Having said that though, I'm actually going to try and take a stab at giving you generalized notions of what's allowed and what's not allowed. So through the courts and through privacy commissioners, um, we have some legal precedents that have been consistent over the last decade or so. What we know, for example, that surveillance is allowed for security purposes, but not for other purposes, such as discipline. So you can't record someone and then discipline them for it because they're doing something wrong in the videotape or whatever it might be. But you can for security purposes in order to maintain the security of the property or of the employer's possession, the property of the employer's you know, tools or, or workplace. Second, surveillance can be allowed for investigation you can use surveillance to investigate a worker, but it must be specific. It can't be generic in general. You can't just always be doing it and say, well, I'm just investigating them just in case they do something wrong because I can't trust them. Right? Has to, you have to have a specific reason why you might need it. Workers must be informed of the surveillance, so you're not allowed surreptitious surveillance. Um, and in general, monitoring for performance or productivity or quality is considered unreasonable. It's considered to be an unfair violation of privacy. There are some differences. There are some exceptions. They've determined, for example, that keystroke monitoring and that phone call recording can be used for quality assurance, but not for uh, performance measurement or, 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 uh, or discipline. Um, some other ones is uh, health information collection is highly restricted. You have to have very damn good reasons to want to collect health information about a worker. Uh, and how you use it is highly restricted and tightly, tightly regulated. Testing, drug testing, psychological testing, that kind of thing, is only allowed in very limited circumstances. For example, drug testing these days is the big one. It ha can only be for what they call safety sensitive positions and post incident only. Random testing of all workers regardless of their position, pre-employment drug testing are all illegal. Illegal, not allowed. 
right? There's even issues about whether you can do any kind of drug testing because the, there are no drug tests that can actually show intoxication levels for drugs. Alcohol is a different matter because we have pretty standard tests about blood alcohol level, right? So, and then when, and this is a court, this is a Supreme, this last piece is a Supreme Court decision that came out last year. Even when using the employer's property, such as a computer, employees still maintain a diminished, but they still maintain a right to privacy. They have, they have the right to, for example, conduct personal business on that computer and not have it be unnecessarily monitored or surveyed by the employer. The Supreme Court made that decision last year. Now, the quick of you, the, 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 the ones who might have a sense of real workplaces, are probably looking at me like, no, no, this is, this is not the case, and you're right. There's a huge mismatch between the law and reality in Canadian workplaces. What we know, for example, is that the monitoring of emails, phone calls, web activity is ubiquitous. A recent survey of Canadian employers shows that 40% of employers have admitted to regularly reviewing their employee emails. And that's in Canada. In the United States, the numbers are, are significantly higher. In, in industries such as construction, drug testing is ubiquitous. Pre-employment, random, um, post-incident, pre-incident, post-party on a Friday night, the good Lord knows. Right? They test all the time in the construction industry. And they're allowed to. And often, the unions sign off on that. They sign an agreement to allow that to happen. GPS in the trucking industry and other kind of transport kind of sectors is, again, Universal. Universal. Every company now knows exactly where every one of its trucks is at any moment of the day. Right? And as we know, your call may be recorded for quality purposes. I mean, I can't remember the last time I didn't get that message when I called a big company. Right? So that too is ubiquitous. So what's going on here? We have a huge gap between what the courts have said our rights are at work and what employers are actually doing. So what's, what's the reason? Well, I argue that it's back to the employment relationship again, right? We're back to the issue where we have a power imbalance at work. So imagine you've applied for a job at a construction company, right? And you need the job, you've been employed for a little while, and they say, well, yeah, you, you look like you might be a good worker. We'll, we're prepared to hire you, but first, you've got to pee in this cup. Now, you have the legal right to say, no, you're not allowed to test me at this point in the employment relationship. Well, what's going to happen? Well, you're not going to get the job, are you? So you might actually be able to file a complaint about that, right? So after two years of legal fights, you might actually get a decision in your favor, right? But who's paid your legal bills along the way? Who's paid your mortgage along the way, right? So what do you do? You pee in the cup, right? And I think part of it also is that we just kind of normalized a lot of these tools and we don't think about it, right? We all love the GPS on our smartphones, right? Or in our car, because it helps us figure out how to get to where we want to get to. But we don't, and so we don't think about the consequences of if it's the employer giving us that GPS, right? And what that means in terms of their ability to be able to continue to monitor us and watch over us. And so I want to take you back to that, section, that, that question about the automated message. And it sounds like some of you already got there on your own, which is great, right? But we don't think about it when we're customers, right? Of what, what is happening to that recording after we've hung up the phone, we've, got, we've dealt with our problem with our bill or whatever it is, and we've moved on, right? What's the employer doing with that phone call? What are they doing with that recording? Well, in often cases, they're using it to measure the performance and decide whether this worker is worth keeping on or not. They'll reprimand them. Right? They'll make determinations about whether they get promoted, whether they make, make it past uh, probation, and so on and so forth. So we actually end up being complicit in the employer's monitoring of their own workers. Right? Um, and I guess just finally, and I don't want to get too, too big about this, but I, like, we in many ways have created, we have, an, we have what I would call, I didn't come up with the phrase, but the Panopticon Society. Right? So the Panopticon was this, Bentham came up with this idea of this prison, where it was designed in such a way that the workers, even whether they actually were the, the, the prisoners, <laughs> um, could be they basically they could be watched no matter where they were, they could be watched at all times. And the whole concept behind it was the guards didn't even have to be in the guard tower. Right? The whole purpose was that it was set up in such a way that the work, the, the here I go again, the prisoners changed their own behavior 
just because they think they might be watched. And I would like to argue that that's what we're doing in society. We just expect, you know, uh, closed caption TV cameras to be, you know, in the mall. And we just expect, um, you know, our, our phone calls to be recorded when we phone the company. We've just come to expect it. And so we just don't even really think about the consequences anymore. Because we've just, we're just so used to having our privacy invaded on so many different levels. Right? We don't, you know, companies asking for our driver's license because they, you know, they want our, in our address and our phone number because we want to buy a couch. And we don't think about what's the purpose of that and what the consequences of that are. So to close off, what is to be done? Which is, of course, the ultimate question. Of course, education and knowledge about this is important. The more we informed about how, what the consequences of the invasion of our privacy are, the more we are going to be capable to stand up against it. Um, but to be quite honest, I'm a big believer that to overcome the power imbalance of the workplace in terms of the issues of privacy, workers need help. We can't just sort of say, yeah, you have the right to not pee in the cup. That doesn't do them a lot of good, right? Um, and so, sure, we could have clear legislation. We could have legislation that states out very clearly what the do's and the don'ts around workplace privacy are and workplace invasions of privacy. But quite frankly, I'm not holding out much hope uh, for that kind of legislation at either level of government anytime soon. Union protection, of course, is important. Unions have, have capacity through their bargaining ability in collective agreements to put in protections of privacy in their collective agreements. Unfortunately, a study a few years ago found that 4% of all collective agreements contain provisions and clay clauses that deal with workplace privacy. Right? So unions could be doing a better job. And finally, I think as consumers, we have to try and figure out how to use our power on behalf of workers. Because we have a little bit of power in that relationship, right? And so we have the ability to say, you know, I'm not, I don't want my phone call recorded. I mean, that, that, that'll take you hours on the telephone. I tried that once. That, that took a while. But I was able to actually, at the end of the day, have a conversation with a staff member without it being recorded. It took me quite a while. It really wasn't worth it because every time I called a company, it would be, take me two hours to get my five minute bits of, of business done. But it was, just, it was an interesting experiment nonetheless. I was able to do it because they cannot record your voice without your consent. So we need to use, as consumers, we need to use our power in that relationship on behalf of workers when and where we can. And at that, I'll just say thank you. We'll take questions after Adam said his. Thank you, Jason. Um, the issues of uh, security and privacy are taken up. Sorry, I'm too close to one of the mics. <laughs> uh, are taken up in, in the next uh, presentation. The move toward government 2.0 identity management system. What's at stake? Uh, this uh, talk is by Adam Molnar. Um, he's a postdoctoral fellow in the Surveillance Studies Center at Queen's University. He specializes in security and privacy issues, particularly in the areas of policing, national security, and public safety governance. More particularly, he explores how collaborative governmental initiatives are arranged and the privacy and security implications that follow. His current research focuses on civilian military relations and the domestic adoption of unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, in Canada. Uh, Adam has published journal articles, book chapters, and policy reports on these issues, and he regularly presents his research domestically and internationally. So, Adam. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a real treat to be here. Uh, this is not the usual audience uh, in terms of the academic uh, specialization that I'm situated in. Um, <clears throat> where we generally geek out on uh, security technologies and surveillance and privacy on a routine basis. Uh, and things can get a little self-referential, uh, although in the past year, particularly with the Snowden revelations, uh, there's been a lot of more public currency around issues of surveillance and privacy. Uh, there seems to be a lot of media traction right now. And so uh, I'm really quite pleased to see this, uh, and I'm quite pleased to be uh, with an audience uh, that is really quite diverse and uh, at a conference that is really quite diverse in the questions that it's raising. So, um, so it's a pleasure for me to be here. And so picking up on 
well, one, I, I would have liked to talk to you about UAVs. That came online a little bit later. Also, we could spend some time talking about C-13, which is recently proposed legislation. Uh, I encourage you to look into it. It's kind of the revival of lawful access uh, from C-30 bill that just got uh, crushed by uh, open media and, and 150,000 signatories on a, on a uh, you know, on a, a sort of uh, protest document. But um, look into this. This is going to be coming up in federal legislation very soon, uh, and I think it concerns Canadians very, very greatly uh, when we talk about the diminishing, diminishing requirements for access to uh, Canadians' personal information by uh, legal authorities. So um, on that note, I'm going to grab the wheel and, and go into identity management systems. This is uh, outside of law enforcement, somewhat, uh, indirectly, anyways. And I want to talk to you today about how governments are moving towards digitized record management uh, and information sharing across government networks uh, and what that means for citizens. In British Columbia, uh, we have recently, over the past five years, which is where I've been to do my PhD at the University of Victoria, so I was able to look into some of these issues with the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association uh, in that province. And uh, we found that, uh, based on our audit of an upcoming um, uh, identity management architecture in BC, a lot of interesting developments and, and a lot of issues and problems that arise from a civil liberties and privacy perspective. So this is not just specific to BC. This is for governments uh, as a whole. Uh, it, and it's linked in with expansion uh, in the capabilities of ubiquitous computing that creates a desire to digitize information on a mass scale. Uh, and of course, once that information is digitized, both the public sector and private sector uh, see it as a means to maximize efficiencies, uh, but also to, to serve as an effective response to download service delivery back into uh, in, in their citizens, back onto the, the hands of the individuals themselves. And so the fusion of ubiquitous computing capabilities with neoliberal policy sort of comes together in a really interesting way, uh, in, in ways that there's a move towards online government service delivery uh, that, that is centered on uh, digitizing this information, sharing it at much larger scale, uh, but then also trying to facilitate uh, access for citizens. Of course, it doesn't always work out that way. So my talk today shares a bit of a story about uh, the BC Services Card, which is a new uh, identity card in British Columbia, uh, but then also more about the, the general move in BC to Government 2.0, the idea that there is uh, digital information management systems uh, as a whole, uh, as a means to join up disparate government agencies. So in BC, they've been developing the technical infrastructure and, and legal framework for a comprehensive identity management system uh, as part of its technology and transformation approach to governance. Uh, and this approach is going to aggregate information, uh, personal information, of the residents of BC in order to link and share this information across government bodies. So the BC service, Services Card, which is a card that you, know, you will carry in your wallet, right now it exists as a combined um, driver's license health card that just came online in, in 2012. Uh, so it's already starting and, and over time this card is going to bring sort of a whole range of other government services into this multi-use functional identity card which in essence will be both the security token uh, when you go to a point of service to authorize that uh, the card says that uh, you say who you are. Uh, so the card is sort of this authentication device, but also is, is a way for, uh, um, in the larger picture, at the back end, for different bodies to link up and share information. So the card um, will enable access to increasing range of services, and it's a key part of the province's wide-ranging vision for integrated identity management uh, that scales between government to government, uh, government to citizen, but also government to private sector. Uh, and it's an emerging vision that will link up um, similar processes that are already happening, um, but are currently unfolding with the federal government. So uh, there have been a lot of developments 
uh, at the federal level around uh, identity management architecture. And it's important to note that the technical standards at the federal level uh, are equal, they're similar, they're uh, interoperable is the word, with what's happening at BC, uh, in BC. So there has been a larger push based on some reports that were done in 2006 at the federal level uh, and also some explicit um, quotes that we were able to receive through access to information requests and policy documents that demonstrate that these two uh, orbiting uh, federated identity management uh, infrastructures will at some point be linked together. And so one of the key concerns for uh, civil libertarians is that this ushers in a sort of move towards a, a national ID card by stealth. And of course, this raises some concerns uh, from security perspective, civil liberties and privacy, and I want to talk to you a little bit today about what those are. Uh, so there's a lot to talk about when you mention identity management um, and this sort of broader transformation. It's really complex. Uh, you know, it's no easy task to try and get the technical architecture right. Uh, it's no easy task to try and do that in a way that minimizes privacy intrusions. Um, and so the challenges that come up uh, with implementing IT projects on such a large scale usually means uh, that they fail. It usually means that they have huge cost overruns um, in BC. You can look at about three different cases over the past six or seven years where you're, or maybe, let's be generous, 10 years, uh, where you're looking at hundreds of millions of dollars for uh, um, plans that have just flopped or are still struggling. So uh, there's the cost concern, there's the privacy concern. Um, so these issues are many. I want to focus on a few of them. So why government 2.0? Uh, what's the point? Um, why are governments now sort of really pushing towards uh, this move to digitize uh, records. Well, one, which is common to hear after 9-11, is that it's a response to the silo process. Uh, the idea that, and I think this is still largely speculative uh, instead of evidence-based, um, that information technology is held up as a solution to complex social problems. If only we had the right information at the right time, we could intervene and we could solve the problem. Uh, so therefore, social problems become reframed in the context of a technological lack, uh, which is a very interesting inclusion and exclusion uh, that I think deserves a lot more uh, focus. Uh, second is that Government 2.0 gets caught up with all kinds of notions about government being modern. Uh, there's this modernization impulse uh, that in order to deliver uh, an effective service, it needs to be uh, digital. It needs to be in the 21st century. Um, and so the silo effect is actually an impediment to being modern. It's outdated. And these discourses are rife, um, and I think they're very powerful um, in the way that you find them routinely in, in policy documents across the board. Uh, ultimately, the move towards the integrated databases has meant a weakening of privacy legislation uh, so that this facilitates greater sharing uh, by government uh, from agency to agency. It's what Jason was speaking about um, under uh, a PEPIDA Canada, which regulates uh, public-private uh, partnerships and information sharing across the public-private threshold. Uh, in BC, uh, I mean, they're also under the jurisdiction of FOIPA, which regulates public-to-public -public sharing. Uh, and public governments can actually share information across agencies without consent uh, of uh, of the citizens. So uh, that's actually already a context that, that this system operates within. I mean, normatively, I think we can make a case, uh, in a, or at least in other exigent or special circumstances, where this would be uh, a problem. Nevertheless, there's an unprecedented move to link increasing amounts of data, uh, and private sector technology is always there to provide a solution, a security solution that enables governments to track and monitor and profile their system users uh, in a way that uh, surveillance, as we saw, can be uh, enhanced. And just as a side note, I did want to mention that surveillance often gets caught up with negative connotation, uh, that it's, uh, it's a, has a negative value and inherently attached to it. 
But surveillance can be defined as any systematic focus on personal information in order to influence, manage, entitle, uh, or control uh, whose information is collected. So it's sort of about sorting. The question of sorting then becomes uh, whether it's for good or for bad purposes. Um, so IT technologies on offer by the private sector enable more precise classification of groups. Uh, the possibility that profiles can be digitized, categories and classifications can be increasingly uh, regimented and standardized uh, across jurisdictions. Uh, and of course, this is on the back of expanded capabilities for information sharing. A lot of this integrated approach emerged in the health sector, where e-health uh, and, of course, a big push from the private sector were interested in collecting longitudinal data uh, across different sectors, uh, or sort of across different element dimensions within the health sector uh, that would join patient information in databases uh, to be used for further research. Uh, also, insurance companies would be very, very interested in this information, uh, and they have routinely tried to um, gain access through a lobby uh, to this information. So given this context, given this push, where does the BC Services card fit in? And what might Alberta, who uh, is expressing the early signs of moving into uh, the same federated identity management structure following the footsteps of BC uh, want to look out for. So I wanted to be a little bit of a signal to maybe the people who are, uh, work on privacy and civil liberties issues in Alberta uh, to let you know uh, that this is on its way in Alberta. Uh, and there are some points to watch out for. So I drew up a little list um, of things that, uh, that Albertans uh, who are interested in these issues uh, might want to look into. Um, this is based on research that we found in the BC case, um, uh, some colleagues of mine. And uh, I think they, they point to some interesting problems with the move to government 2.0 systems in general. So first, all of the rationales that we came across um, whether it's fraud detection, uh, that is trying to cut down on, uh, on healthcare fraud by having a, a healthcare card that has biometric enhancements uh, that will have uh, greater security features as a security token, uh, that this card was the solution to cut down on fraud. Uh, those numbers were not substantiated by the BC government. Uh, and in fact, uh, we found other numbers uh, that uh, insists that healthcare fraud, by and large, in a larger uh, scope, occurs within the medical profession itself. So you're looking at abnormal billing, you're looking at uh, um, imprecise reporting. Uh, you're look so, so really here, if you're, if you're interested in looking, cutting down on fraud, uh, you might not want to move to uh, an enhanced, biometrically enhanced uh, healthcare security token. Of course, this undermines the justifications of why we might need a card like this in the first place. So uh, that speaks to other redundancies uh, for cards that we already have. Health cards that, that already work quite well, uh, driver's licenses that have now become security tokens, and so on. Second, we found that public consultations were incredibly lacking. Um, just two weeks before the card rolled out, um, this was based on a push that we had uh, in media uh, and an event that the BC Civil Liberties Association had uh, that the government decided that they wanted to consult with uh, British Columbians. Uh, and this was, of course, after they had announced the launch date for the card, after they had spent uh, over $150 million, uh, after they had been working on this for nine years. Uh, so really, uh, I think it's past time for consultations. They finally just started to have focus groups with citizens of BC uh, actually a week and a half ago. This is after they've announced the rollout. Third, uh, there's a distinct lack of transparency. Uh, we tried to file access to information requests, uh, tried to conduct interviews with uh, officials from ICBC, Ministry of Health, Office of the Chief Information Officer. We were rejected in an overwhelming amount of cases. Um, 
uh, BC Civil Liberties Association had many, many replies that were uh, outright uh, ignored or uh, no documents could be returned upon request. Uh, so this was a, a struggle for us to even learn about what the card, what the security features of the card were, what the database architecture even looked like, uh, so that we could try and figure out, is it vulnerable to hackers? Uh, a very, very uh, significant question in our, our historical period. It was very, very difficult to get that information. Uh, and then, of course, as many of you know, if you do public interest research, you probably find that the government is now moving to uh, a form of oral government where uh, sensitive information is exchanged only through verbal communication. And that information uh, is not uh, documented in emails uh, if it is considered sensitive by government. This has caused uh, Liz Denham, who's the uh, Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner in BC, to try and push for a mandate to have a duty to report within government uh, on uh, all issues so that the public can have access. Identity policies pose classic privacy and civil liberties concerns, just cards themselves, because we see cards as entitlement cards. They allow us certain privileges. They authorize us to drive a car. Uh, that same card can mutate and allow us to uh, buy alcohol uh, in the store. Uh, so uh, they afford certain privileges. At the same time, they should be understood as disenfranchisement cards uh, because they link up with a lot of other concerns um, about who writes the category of the identity who's on the card, which populations are included in the card, uh, how are social policies sort of governed through these identities that are often formed by uh, government officials, but then also by vendors who are very much interested in developing the technology and the standards bodies uh, who regulate how the architecture works itself. So between these layers, uh, the, the identity gets formed. And this is by and large being driven, uh, and it's been called uh, a card cartel uh, by surveillance studies scholar David Lyon that shows how, uh, how an identity is constituted is by and large out of the hands, out of the individuals uh, whose identity is at stake. Uh, and the administrative and technical processes that uh, underline these systems uh, are very important democratic issues, for, for the, uh, especially when you consider the significance of moving towards government service delivery uh, on a digitized basis. As I mentioned, there's rapidly growing evidence that um, thanks. There's rapidly growing evidence that these systems are prone to failure, uh, that they leave a legacy of white elephants. Uh, this could very well be the um, uh, the destiny of the proposed identity management system in BC. We're kind of waiting to see how that looks, and. Um, and they also are prone to breaches of confidentiality on a large scale. I did want to make one last note about the private sector. There is a credential brokerage service who's named SecureKey, who sits, uh, is supposed to sit between government and a citizen and the public body as a way to anonymize that transaction so that the government doesn't actually see, you know, there's anonymous numbers. I would go into uh, secure key, secure key would consult to the agency. Anonymous numbers would be passed back and forth. Identity authentication could then be, or credential brokerage could then be authenticated. Uh, nobody would, the idea that I wouldn't get to see what the government is accessing, the government wouldn't get to see what they had other information about me. Data minimization, great rule for privacy. Uh, however, secure key as a private sector company who's come online, uh, in essence, still maintains access to these records, uh, and they are able to um, they are able to collect this data. We don't really know what their data retention logs look like, what the relationship with law enforcement is when you consider lawful access questions and the hybrid hybridization between public private sector, the increasing reliance that law enforcement uh, has on the collection of data in the private sector. Uh, you can look towards social networking services as a key example of this. Uh, and of course, when you consider this in light of uh, the reduced uh, oversight requirements in our upcoming bill like C-13, 
uh, and the vast amounts of data that are being collected and retained for extended periods, you then begin to have a mosaic uh, of, uh, of a, at least that invites uh, some concerns around security and privacy violations uh, moving forward. So these are all questions that, uh, that we've raised, uh, and I do know that Alberta has signed a contract with SecureKey, which has standards between federal, provincial uh, in BC and provincial in Alberta. Uh, and if things work out for SecureKey, they will have Canada wrapped up uh, in the next five to seven years. That's their words. They're a, a credential brokerage service that, that sits between a point of service when I would come use my card and a government service. So that a, a anonymous number comes off my card to secure key. Uh, secure key backs with a registry, which has a separate number, a meaningless but unique number, uh, to authenticate that that is the right card. Uh, they, and they minimize the amount of data that goes that is just in the transition. It's supposed to be a triple blind um, process, which is intended to protect privacy, but SecureKey as a private entity is still able to collect all of that data. Um, they're still able actually to have the linkages uh, at their disposal, um, and so they could seemingly, uh, if prompted, uh, be able to, to trace the associations. Um, so of course, it's, it's steps in the right direction to try and think about the ways that I'm not reaching over and dipping into Jason's database and getting more information that I need uh, if I'm in social services and, and he's education and I want to like hoover up all his data and then make a sort of indiscriminate decision about a file, um, I would only get the little bit that I need uh, that would be released to me uh, and more or less under anonymous conditions. They would know who was asking for the information at education, for instance. So. This is, this is right. This, I think this is a good step. It's, it's building the, tech, the privacy controls into the technology. However, one of the things we're not talking about are the ways that uh, the private sector, which is regulated by a different set of uh, uh, economic interests, uh, and then also legislative interests, um, are now entering into the fold, uh, and these questions aren't really coming up on the radar. Thank you so much. I would like to really thank both presenters for keeping to the time. That was wonderful. And of course, the, unofficially, the question and answer session already started. I would just like to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to ask questions. So please ask uh, a, a you know, short question or comment. Please identify yourself. And we have two mics, one mic over there, and I have one. So um, yeah, we'll start there, and then we go in the front of the room. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Mike Scott, uh, president of a municipal local here in Edmonton, QB Local 30. Uh, Jason, I'm, uh, I, thanks for the presentation on, on both of you folks. Um, I'm really concerned, Jason, with what you said about um, the, uh, the level of intoxication in a drug test. And uh, another thing that we, we have is we do have post-incident testing in the city, and if it shows traces, then boom, they're guilty. Right, so we want to know. I want to know if there's a way we can challenge that legally. And I have a second question in regards to uh, the GPS. When the GPS was introduced into city vehicles, it was under the service ability only that we would be tracking the usage of the vehicle. And now we have people who sit in in job sites watching the GPS board, <laughs> sitting there going, "Okay, you sat at that 7-Eleven for an hour." So I'm wondering if there's a way that we can get that language. I, I'm interested in hearing some language on uh, put us put. Uh, protections of privacy and collective bargaining, uh, collective agreements. So, how we could get on that, and uh, how we can fight the intoxication levels. Thanks. Right. Well, I'll start with your first question first. Um, the issue of drug. Uh, what, what I'll say, sort of generally first, is that we're about to get a lot of clarity around drug testing in the next year or two. Um, the communication, energy, and paper workers, when they were the communication, energy, and paper workers. Um, we're particularly effective across the country at fighting drug testing, and they've been pushing a lot, a number of cases up through, uh, and there's a, there's a hearing pending at the Supreme Court of Canada um, that should, we hope, clarify some senses of what, what's allowed around drug and alcohol testing. What, what I can tell you at the moment 
um, is post-incident testing is allowed. Um, the, so with alcohol, that's pretty straightforward, right? Um, the reason the drugs is a little more complicated is because we don't have any effective me measures of what is determination of intoxication of a, of, of a drug. So let's say that you uh, smoked some marijuana yesterday um, and you've come to work today, there is the chance that there still would be some residual traces in your body, right? Doesn't mean you're intoxicated, right? Unlike alcohol, where you've got this nice direct correlation between the level of alcohol in your, in your bloodstream and your degree of intoxication. We don't have those kinds of measurements as easily or as, as, as universally accepted. And so as a result, drugs becomes a lot more questionable. Um, around what to do if someone's tested positive, well then we kick into the whole area of around duty to accommodation and disability around, because um, addiction to uh, drugs and alcohol is seen as a disability in Canada. And that's a lot of what's, we've all evolved around that. However, if the, if the member says, I'm not, a, if, the, if the member, for example, is Rob Ford, um, Rob Ford could be fired. Um, because he's saying he's not an addict. He's saying he does not have an addiction, and so therefore he loses the protection of uh, the duty to accommodate under, under human rights law. So I don't, I, I won't, I don't want to press the details on that too much because the details can get us down a really big, ra really deep rabbit hole. Um, your other question, probably most of that conversation might be better off offline in terms of sort of language and that kind of thing. The key in terms of the principles around this is that there is nothing preventing the employer from gathering GPS data. I think when, when you think about going to the bargaining table, what you need to talk about is creating, putting um, barriers around what they do with the data, right? So I don't know if they're, if, if, they're, if they're doing discipline, like if they caught the guy at the 7-Eleven at the for an hour, did they give him a reprimand, did they give him a suspension, like do they actually do some kind of punishment? That's where it becomes problematic. And so that's what you can fight, is that they can't discipline based upon that data. Um, they're allowed to track where their, tr where their trucks are, right? That there's nothing we can do to stop that. All you can really do in your language when you're bargaining or you're grieving is to try and create a bit of a firewall around what they do with the data once they have it. Hi, uh, uh, Alvin Finkel with Athabasca University. Um, I have to admit I'm not surprised by any of this stuff. Uh, <laughs> when I was uh, 14, I got a job as a credit reporter uh, with the Credit Clearing Bureau of uh, Greater Winnipeg. So this was 1963. And uh, I mean, I, it, it, the Big Brother stuff was incredible. Uh, literally, uh, there was files of everybody in that city. And there seemed to be no restrictions of any kind uh, about what anybody could say about anybody else uh, and what we would be reading out to employers and to police and to creditors. So I'm wondering, I mean, that was before there was much in the way of human rights legislation. I, um, I almost lost my job because I, I read out one file and had decided not to read out the fact that the guy was, was black. And uh, the uh, person at the other end of the line knew that, asked me to put it on the file. I said, well, actually, it is already there. And told the employer, and I was almost fired for not reading the full file. So my question is, what, what restrictions uh, exist even now to limit uh, the kinds of information that creditors and employers are able to collect about you uh, and share uh, or try to obtain. Because, I mean, like I say, in, uh, in 50 years ago already, it seemed like Big Brother had everything. Um, sorry, who was this question directed to? Or was it I, think, I think it would be more uh, for Adam, but to some degree it's for both because, you know, and like I say, employers would call too as opposed to simply uh, creditors. I mean, people would want to know uh, everything and, you know, we'd be reading up stuff. Well, the landlord says he had bed bugs, this kind of stuff. Thank you. Adam, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I would prefer to answer that question in the context of lawful access. That's where a lot of my research uh, has, has focused. Um, and so what restrictions exist? In the criminal code of Canada, there is a voluntary, there's a voluntary disclosure for the private sector to disclose this information. Um, they, there is uh, production orders, which is a, kind of like a US subpoena, except we have oversight on it. Uh, it's not some, and that's, that's a sort of a low level warrant to access data or information. And then you have 
another warrant that you can seize computer hard drives or, or other material information, other like hardware that has information on it. So we do have, uh, we do have judicial oversight when it comes to production orders. Unlike in the US, uh, they have subpoena powers which are applicable to a wide range of, of uh, legal agencies, like uh, authorities, where they can basically get a subpoena and issue it to compel disclosure of that information uh, without a warrant um, to a company in the private sector. Uh, so the explosion of subpoenas in um, the US is just massive. It's, it's insane. Um, interestingly, another restriction, so, so we do have judicial oversight. Uh, there's some concern right now about what constitutes uh, communications data and what constitutes transmissions data. If you look into lawful access to telecommunications, um, we might know a little bit more, we might be a little bit more literate about what metadata is uh, after the Snowden um, bonanza, but um, which is basically collecting data that which log records that would show I called Jason at this time, uh, at this number, uh, and that's not actually communication data. It therefore exists under a lower legal threshold for access, uh, yet it paints a remarkably clear picture uh, of someone's life. You can map in really great detail. And there's more and more of this metadata that, that is, we're just sort of leaking out every day, everywhere we go. Uh, so there's some concern about that legal definition right now, placing a restriction on that. Uh, finally, um, in the context of, of 2.0, like government 2.0, it matters where the server is. Uh, it matters what networks the data um, runs across. So for instance, if there's a server in Mountain View, California, uh, Google, or in Palo Alto, Facebook, and there's law enforcement in Canada who says, we need information uh, off of Google's servers, uh, Google will say, well, uh, you know, that's great, we're in a different legal jurisdiction, so long as you get a warrant in your host jurisdiction and serve it unto us, uh, our legal counsel will look at it and we'll fill it out and, and you'll likely get the information. There's it's a bit of a murky area whether our warrants are allowed to uh, um, operate extraterritorially. That's a question that we don't have worked out yet, uh, but there is a term letter rogatory where you, you know, it can travel. Uh, other companies like Twitter will be like, get lost. Um, you're not American, and we're not going to honor any of your warrants. So there's a huge patchwork here. Uh, and one of the other concerns, at least in the Canadian context, is uh, companies are incentivized. Uh, there's an economic incentive to, to sell this data to law enforcement. Uh, so there's now companies like AT&T, uh, or you know, in Canada, I know Bell, uh, Rogers, um, even credit, uh, there's credit rating agencies. Uh, they are sharing information uh, at cost to law enforcement. Um, they just don't want their customers to know about it because if they do, they run, uh, they, they run the risk of a privacy nightmare. Uh, so there's this whole other sort of market that's opening up uh, and the deep pockets of law enforcement are able to, to sort of you know, pay a fairly decent sum for this data uh, and access it uh, really quite quickly. I'll, I'll just quickly add, because I think Adam's answer was quite thorough. Um, in, in terms of the work, in, in the work situ situation, in the private sector, essentially in Alberta, it's, it's PIPA, which is the Personal Information Protection Act, uh, or PEPIDA in jurisdictions around the country that don't have them, which basically tries to lay out sort of the boundaries of what an employer is allowed to collect both about the public and about, um, and, and about its own employees. The problem is, is that because it, we've foisted the power of, of interpretation and, 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 and decision making around that to a privacy commissioner, an, an officer of the Legislative Assembly, it's a, it's a, it's a patchwork, mishmash combination of decisions based on specific cases, and so we don't have any really clear, solid ground rules. Um, and of course. I didn't want to talk about it because it's a bit off topic, but the, the Alberta's Protection Act just got ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court last, last week or two, which even throws it even more up into the air in terms of what the boundaries are. 
looking at the time, and I, I think we'll take a couple of questions uh, together so that uh, we'll save some time. Uh, and, and I was also wondering, in the process of answering those questions, if you could also probably talk a little bit about the private uh, vendor sharing data amongst themselves, which is also apparently really big business, and how that also impacts on, on this debate. Uh, so we'll take a few questions, uh, one, two, and three, oh, and four. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure how to, how to word my question, but I see this surveillance problem as being a continuation of, uh, of uh, consumerism in which uh, looking at the history of advertising in which uh, uh, companies thought, well, okay, uh, we can uh, manipulate people through advertising, get, get them to buy whatever we want, and uh, they've proven to be quite successful because as of 2008, the American economy was 70 70 percent uh, consumerism and uh, so I, I I see this as uh, uh, we can say that these companies what what why is this all going on is it not there's this fierce competition within the capitalist system whereby you do anything and everything to maximize profit so uh, I, I think this is just a natural uh, part of the order of things and so ultimately we must take account of the motive. What are the motives of people and separate uh, those that uh, we can trust from those we can't trust. And some, I think that's really important. And here, we should also look at each one of us as individuals to realize that in our thinking, do we approve of the capitalist system and those people that are most successful in it? Uh, the, the idea of socialism now, I, I read uh, blogs where, oh, this person is, I really like what he says, and then suddenly he comes up and says something that, which indicates that he has no, uh, n that socialism is this ultimately completely evil thing, that capitalism is the only thing that, the only way to go. So I, I, I think that we need to um, put this into uh, uh, a greater context. Uh, my question is uh, is to Adam. Um, it, my understanding of the opposition to the gun law, uh, the gun registry a few years ago, uh, was that people did not want uh, to divulge that they had guns. Uh, now, uh, it seems to me that uh, such a hue and cry for that incident or that regulation or proposed regulation would be small compared to the invasion of our privacy in every aspect of our life. So my question is, is there any hue and cry against this kind of uh, secure, key or, secure key you're talking about? I, I want to comment on a, a couple of things I think you missed. Um, I, I'm surprised that there's no mention made of the colossal amount of U United States surveillance of us in Canada. Did you know, for example, that commencing with our lone MP from Alberta when the Libs were last in power in Ottawa, that I read on... Um, uh, alternative website that we had agreed to allow the Americans to review all of the income tax data from all of us in Canada in their search for terrorists. I presented this article to two senators and I said, is this true? And they didn't know and undertook to get back to me, but they never did, so I assume it's true. Now, the you mentioned uh, about certain rights that, that people have um, against searches and so on by their employer. But you have to mention that depending on what employer you have, for example, if you work for national defense, um, you, you go on a base where the base commander is like one notch less than God, and you're subject to any kind of a search anytime. That's just the way it is. Um, with regard to 
um, things where we might expect reasonable treatment from employers, we have to know that there's distinctly different laws for that category of employers, employees who are um, in unions as opposed to those who are not. And in fact, if you're in a union, um, you may very well have less rights than a person who's not unionized because in, if you're in a union, um, your employer can do anything to you that you can't prevent them from doing in the contract, with one exception. There's only one thing, if you're a teacher, that a, a school board has to be reasonable about. When they want to fire you, I'm sorry, you have to wait for a question, I don't even have one. Um, but you did invite comments, I recall. Now, if you uh, are looking for the one instance where an employer has to be reasonable as a school board, it's when they fire you. If they aren't reasonable when they fire you, you can take them to court. Um, I think we should know those things. Um, they really encroach on freedoms and they are not often thought of when we think about how little control we have over our lives. Thank you. Um, sorry, so we have time for one quick last question and then uh, the presenters will have very little time to respond. Thank you very much. Uh, I am going to describe to you a situation in which I think there are conundrums about implied consent, about whose quality and whose privacy. And this is in a residential care facility, which as you go into it, posts a notice that you may be recorded on CCTV. And yet, if you want to put a camera in a room to monitor the care that's being provided to someone, that's deemed illegal, probably not useful, and you didn't get consent. Given that we have very little time since lunch is supposed yeah. to start so in like five, six minutes, uh, I, I would request that uh, you sort of instead of addressing the questions in, uh, individually, if you could have sort of final thoughts, um, uh, so take two, three minutes sure. each, and then of course this, co this conversation will continue afterwards as well. Sorry. Okay, um, quick. Uh, the why no pushback? Um, I think in many ways uh, it has to do with the routine way that we engage with our digital technology, the sort of banality of, of surveillance, of the fact that we are given, uh, afforded certain privileges uh, and enhancements in using digital communication, uh, and that we don't really understand what happens on the back end on the, the network infrastructure uh, where data is being intercepted, where it's, who it's being shared with. So I think by and large, we just aren't fully informed. Uh, and you know, as an extension to that, when is the last time that you read a privacy policy on a social networking service without <laughs> glazing over and, and, and drooling on yourself? Like, it, it doesn't, it's not possible. Um, uh, nobody actually gets to the bottom of those things. And, um, <clears throat> and so I think in that sense, you know, we see we see a kind of routine engagement. We see um, the fact that th this information is not uh, made literate to the wider public. Uh, and then, of course, you have a lack of transparency uh, by governments who are developing these programs uh, without meaningful public consultation. Uh, and then on that basis, they uh, devoid themselves of any accountability. And so I think, um, I think there's a whole host of different problems. Um, those are, I think, just a few of them. So Jason, you want to continue? Um, I guess I'll just say two things. One, in the case of the care home, I, I, I think that's actually a really brilliant point. Like, and it shows, I think which is the broader point I've been trying, I, I, I was hoping to make today was that we can have 
these sorts of laws that create protections and create sort of limitations on certain people's, you know, organization's behavior, whether that be the state or whether that be a private corporation. But at the end of the day, those laws get, me get mediated through power relationships, right? And so whether in the case of the area that I look at, which is the workplace employment relationship with a power relationship, or in the case where the CCTV camera works is perfectly acceptable when it's the institution that is doing the recording, but when someone's trying to protect a vulnerable patient, suddenly the law gets used in such a fashion that you can't, you can't protect that vulnerable person. And I think that's, that shows the problematic nature of trying to create a privacy regime that is anchored in, in sort of basically liberal senses of law around individual senses of human rights, and that rights are possessed as individuals um, and not as in groups and that you don't have collective human rights, that we only have individual human rights. That's kind of how our constitution and how our legal structure has been established. And that, it's those kinds of problems that crop up then, right? Um, and that privacy has that particular conundrum, is that it's there to protect us as individuals. But half, much, much of our lifetime, we're not, we don't need protection as individuals, we need protection as collectives, right? And that's the, so the, that's where the law becomes a mismatch with what actually happens in the world. Um, and, and, and to your thoughts about what got missed, I think all I'll quickly say since we're running out of time is I do think you have a misreading of employment law around the union and non-union environment. Um, because it's not that we're, unionized workers have fewer rights. When it comes to the privacy legislation, it applies equally because it's not dealing with any particular employment regime. And so privacy legislation deals with, with all workers equally whether they're in a union or not. The only difference that happens with the union is that they can then also add extra protections through their poten potentially through their collective agreement. Um, and that would be the only difference. Well, we can have a conversation about that afterward, but you know, I think I know a thing or two about employment law. I would, I would like to thank the presenters. with little tokens of appreciation from Parkland. Um, and also thank you so much to the audience for a very stimulating conversation. And as you know, this conversation will continue on for the next day and a half that we are all together. Uh, lunch is probably almost already served. Um, I'm not sure where exactly it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, um, but I'm sure as you go out. Follow someone who knows. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure we'll find a way. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, once again.